We're going to look at what the Bible says about what it means to be a woman. Proverbs 31.30, which says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. This is a good verse, isn't it? Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And why is that? I would say because charm and beauty are only the, outs the outside, but the inside is what really counts. And we're going to see that a lot tonight. The Bible consistently says that what's inside is more important than what's outside. So we're going to first look at the world's view of women, right? What does the world say about women? What does the world say women should be like? So women and men are the same, but really women are better in every way. Doesn't that seem to be the case? The world says that anything you can do, I can do better, right? Women, women and men are equal, which is why we have all the craziness in our culture. We're equally made in the image of God. Yes, we are both made in the image of God, but men and women are different. They are very different. They're, and that's good. That's how God made it. So the, the world says though that we're the same and really women are way better. Women don't need men to be happy. That is what the world consistently says. Now, in one sense, that's true. You don't need a man to be happy, but it's said with an attitude of, I don't need any man to be happy. Like, men are lesser. Women have the right to repro reproductive health. Have you got, how many of you guys have heard the term reproductive health before? That's a euphemism, which means women have the right to kill their children inside the womb. That's what the world says, right? Because if women are equal to men, then they should be able to sleep with whoever they want without any consequences, right? And so if that's the case, then women should be able to kill their unborn children. That's what the world believes. Very unbiblical. Women are the responsible, thoughtful, intelligent ones, right? Last week we saw that the boys, they're imbeciles, they're unintelligent, they're kind of morons. The world says that women are smart, thoughtful, responsible, Sadly, sometimes that's true. Guys, sometimes that's true. And it's good that women are responsible, thoughtful, and intelligent. Women are good at communicating, empathizing, and sympathizing. Women love to talk. That is true, right? But actually, I know some guys who talk way too much as well, so it's not just a woman thing. All right, the world's view of women continued. Now, here's where it gets funny. Women are ditzy. Right? Have you heard that before? Especially blonde women? Right? That's uh, legally blonde. So these are, these are the world's views. I'm not saying they're biblical. Women only care about how they look. It's all that is important to them. They're very outwardly focused, the world says. Women are shopaholics. Sometimes true, but not necessarily. Women are emotional and can't be held responsible for their emotions and behavior. The world says that too, don't they, right? Oh, she's just emotional, it's okay, let it go. Have you ever heard the uh, phrase, happy wife, happy life? What does that mean? Husband will say, happy wife, do whatever she wants, and then we'll be happy because she's gonna get emotional, she's gonna get erratic. That's not how women are called to be or should be allowed to be. That's not a biblical way. Women are manipulative. That is a very much a trope of women for the world. All right. So the world's view of women. I'm taking the same verse as last week. Ecclesiastes 7.28 says, Though I have searched repeatedly, I have not found what I was looking for. Only one out of a thousand men is virtuous, but not one woman. But I did find this, God created people to be virtuous, but they have each turned to follow their own downward path. Now I find that interesting how he, he, he found one man maybe, but not one woman. And what does that tell us? The reality is every single one of us is a sinner. Every single one of us fails. Every single one of us needs Jesus. And there is no good, perfect woman. So I just wanna start up front, young ladies, 
that as I go through the biblical standards of what a woman is, these are high standards. These are high calling. But it's only by God's grace that you can fulfill them. And even then, you're going to fail. Just like the men are going to fail at being godly men. But by God's grace, we can rise to the occasion, right? We can, we can live up to what God has called us to. So what is the standard for women in the Bible? Can anyone guess? It's Jesus. Wait a minute, what? Jesus is a man. But the Bible says to men and women that he is the perfect standard. Now, he's not the perfect standard of femininity, but he's the perfect standard of human beingness. He is the perfect human being. And every one of us are human. And so our goal, men and women, should be to be like Jesus in every way that we can. So though, though Jesus is a man, he is the perfect human being, and he is the example for all. In Romans 8, 29, we looked at that last week, but if you have your Bibles, you guys can turn there. We're going to look up a few verses. Romans 8, 29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And so he predestined us to be conformed into the image of Christ, into the image of his Son. Also, Ephesians 4.22 says that we are to be like God, who Jesus is God. Ephesians 4.22 says to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. So the new self is after the likeness of God. It is conform to the image of Christ. And so your goal, young ladies, is to be like Christ in every way that you can be. Now, obviously, you're not going to try to be a man, right? But in as far as Jesus is humble and kind and patient and strong and courageous and good, so are you to be. So like Christ in every way that you can be. So the Bible's picture of a woman. First of all, biblical women are humble, non-defensive, and willing to admit when they are wrong. They look to Jesus for grace and forgiveness, right? So there's an amazing example, and this woman will always be remembered for what she did. So let's look at Luke chapter seven, and we'll see this great humility of this woman. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. It says, <clears throat> One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. That is, Jesus went to the Pharisee's house. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now this is how we should be towards Jesus, humbly going before him, mourning over our sin. Last week we saw the tax collector who would not lift his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast. This week we see the woman who cries tears and washes Jesus' feet with her tears. Her sorrow is over her sin. She's very humble. She's not going to Jesus and saying, well, Jesus, you know, you should really forgive me because I've done a lot of good things. You know, you should really excuse me from this sin because my parents were bad. I had bad parents. She's not defensive. She's not going and defending herself. She's going to Christ in complete humility saying, I was wrong. Please forgive me. So verse 36, and standing, or 38, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, 
he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. You see, she saw the greatness of her sin. She saw how much debt she was in for her sin. And she went to the Lord begging forgiveness. And she was forgiven. If we look at verse 50, it says, He said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Secondly, biblical women love God and they love others. They follow God's word, not their feelings. Does that sound familiar? Same thing we said last week about biblical men. It's true though. Biblical women love God and they love other people. They don't think about themselves and they don't follow their feelings. Let's look at Esther. Esther chapter 4. She did something really amazing that took a lot of courage, a lot of bravery. Now, who remembers where Esther is in the Old Testament? Is it right before Psalms? Job, I, Esther, Job, Psalms. Esther, Job. I forget. After Nehemiah. Okay. I wasn't sure if it was before or after Psalm. All right, Esther 4, 8. It says, Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. So what was happening was there was this evil man named Haman who wanted all the Jews to be killed. They were living in Babylon, far away from Israel, far away from Jerusalem because they had been taken into captivity. And Esther, a Jew, had become the wife of the king of Babylon, which is kind of crazy. But she was his wife. And so she could talk to him, but not just anytime she wanted. She actually hadn't seen him for 30 days because this king had many wives. So he didn't really care about her a whole lot. But this decree went out because of somebody trick, some trickery. He got a, the king to decree that all the Jews would be killed. So Esther was going to die. All the Jews were going to die. Her uncle Mordecai said, Esther, you have to talk to the king and tell him not to do this. So let's see what happens. And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law, to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come to the king these 30 days. So she goes to see the king to say, save my people. It's very likely the king will have her put to death because she has no right to approach the king. It's against the law. But if the king puts out his scepter and accepts her, she'll live and the king will hear her. Well, what does she say? And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told him to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews for if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Maybe God put you here at this time for this situation, is what he's saying. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. So she said, you know what? I'm going to do it. And if I die, I die. If I perish, I perish. It took a lot of courage, a lot of boldness. Literally walking through that door meant she might die in a little bit. But she did it anyway for the love of God 
and the love of others. She wasn't thinking about herself. So godly women love God and love others and they don't follow their feelings. They do what is right, even though it may be fearful, even though it may be difficult. All right, where is the passage in the Bible where you learn a lot about what a godly woman looks like? It's a whole, like a whole chapter. Huh? Mm, close. <coughs> oh, Titus 2, yes, <coughs> is one of them. Proverbs 31, yes, Proverbs 31. We are going to look at Titus 2 as well. But the Proverbs 31 woman. <coughs> Sorry, guys. <coughs> Swallowed down the wrong tube here. Proverbs 31. So I'm going to read it, and then we're going to talk about some characteristics. And so I want, what I want you to do is, if you have it, go to that, that page. Proverbs 31, it starts in verse 10. It talks about the excellent wife. But you could also say the excellent woman, right? It's, this isn't just for wives. Some of it is because she, she takes care of her children. But these are things to strive for. Now, the Proverbs 31 woman doesn't do all these things in one day. Okay? I just want to tell you that. Or even one week. It's, it's how she is over a lifetime. This is her character. So listen carefully and then we'll go, we'll go over it. Proverbs 31, starting in verse 10. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it, and with the fruit of her hands she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength, and her arms are strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hand to the distaff, and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out to her, her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself and clothing is fine linen. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity. No emergency? All right. Strength and di dignity are her clothing and she laughs at the time to come. She opens, sorry, I lost my spot. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. What a woman, right? This beautiful Proverbs 31 woman. So some of the things, and you guys heard all of it, but are the biblical women are strong and hardworking. They are not lazy, laying around in bed, sleeping in all day. I feel like there's a lot of stuff on Facebook or Instagram or whatever of women who are like, ah, I I slept in today and I'm just doing a day of self-care. And it's like, I'm getting my nails done and I'm going to do this and I'm just going to take care of myself. It's like, that's, that's not a Proverbs 31 woman, right? That It's all about me. Now, it's not wrong to take care of yourself. You need to take care of yourself. But if it's like, I'm going to post on the internet about how I love myself so much, you're not in the right place. You're not in the right frame of mind. Biblical women are going to be strong and they're going to be hardworking. Biblical women are wise and they speak words of life. The way this, this woman talks, people know her. They like to hear from her. They like to see when she's coming because she's always saying 
something good, something that's building people up. Her words are wise and she brings life. Biblical women plan ahead and they're prepared. This woman has clothes for her children when winter comes. So she's not thinking about just the moment, just today. She's thinking about the future. She's preparing and taking care of her home. Biblical women love their children and their family. They take care of their family. They love them deeply. Biblical women are respectful and reverent. You know why? Her husband praises her. Her husband loves her. Her husband can't stop saying enough good about her because she is so good to him. Biblical women are dignified. She clothes herself with strength and dignity. Dignified, you could be over dignified in the sense that you're looking down on people. But what dignified means is that you comport yourself in a way that you're not going to be ashamed of what you look like, what you say, or what you do, but you can have self-assurance and be sure of yourself. So living in a dignified manner. Biblical women are generous and selfless. She stretches out her hands to the poor, right? She's She's doing all this not for herself. She's doing it to bless other people, even people not inside her family. Biblical women do not worry. Now, that's interesting because it's almost cool to worry these days, right? Women, women talk about worrying, and it seems to be more of a woman thing. That doesn't mean men don't worry. They do too. But <clears throat> she laughs at the future. The Proverbs 31 woman looks ahead of the future and she laughs. She has no fear. She has no concerns. She has no worries because she knows the Lord and she's not plagued by fear. She doesn't live in fear. She lives trusting God. And so that's a picture of a biblical woman. All right, let's look at some more passages. Biblical women know when to be busy and when to be still and engage in the moment. Let's look at Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now this is important because if you read the Proverbs 31 woman, she gets up before the sun and stays up burning the candle at both ends, right? It says she's, she's burning the candle into the night. She's getting up before the sun. If you did that every day, you'd start to have problems, right? So this, this is not a one day thing or an everyday thing. <clears throat> the biblical woman knows when she needs to be busy, she knows when she needs to work hard and she works hard. She knows when she needs to slow down and when she needs to sit and be still before the Lord. So let's look at Luke chapter 10. Verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Now think about that. Jesus comes to your house. You're going to make your house nice. You're probably going to be busy making sure all the dishes are, are set out right. All the, all the house is clean. Everything is good. Everything's working. Martha is the best hostess, right? She's working on everything. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. So here Mary is just sitting there doing nothing. And Martha's running around everywhere trying to make this a nice experience for Jesus, the Son of God, right? So, I don't think it was wrong that Martha was trying to be a good hostess. But what's wrong is how she responds. She says in verse 40, but Martha was distracted with much serving. She was distracted from what the Lord was doing. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Here she's accusing Jesus that he doesn't care. Jesus is like, Martha, Martha, you must understand. You are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So Mary chose to sit at Jesus' feet. Now, there's a time to be busy and a time to work hard, but there's also a time to sit at Jesus' feet and be still. There's a time to slow down. And there's times like that every single day where you should be still before the Lord. And so a biblical woman knows when to be busy and when to be still, and when to engage in the moment. She thinks about these things and she is wise. 
Also, biblical women are submissive to God, which leads to glad submission to authority, to parents, to your boss, and to your husband one day, right? None of you are married yet. But notice I didn't say your boyfriend. Yeah, your boyfriend's not your husband. You do not need to submit to him. You submit to your dad, right? So the Bible says, what does it say in Ephesians 6, 1 through 3? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, girls, you might be thinking, well, I don't really want to submit to my parents because, well, if you knew my mom, you would understand. Or I don't really want to submit to my dad because he doesn't really, he's not really a very good Christian. I don't even know if he is a Christian. So I'm not going to, I don't need to submit to him. But when I get married, I'll submit to my husband. Don't fool yourself. Right now is your time to practice being submissive. If it's hard to be submissive to your parents, it's going to be hard to be submissive to your, your husband, right? So you need to cultivate in your heart a submissive attitude. And not just because you're a girl. Did you know that men need to submit to God as well and to the authorities in their life? We all need to submit to somebody. And we all need to submit with a humble heart, a willingness to follow the leader that God has put in our life, whether it be our parents, our, our boss, or authorities in our like police or the law or various things, or your husband one day, right? And so a godly woman is submissive. Now, and I would just, a word, a word of wise wisdom to the guys. If you meet a young girl, and you're getting to know her and you see that she very much disrespects her parents and she's not submissive to them all at all guess what if you get married to her she probably is not going to be submissive to you right she might be while she's while you're dating because you know you're the best thing since sliced bread but after a while things might change so don't don't underestimate the importance of that. And submission, you know, is not a popular word in our culture today, right? In our culture, it's men and women are the same. I'm not going to submit to any man. But this is a very biblical principle. And I think the Bible talks about it a lot. And it's a beautiful thing in God's eyes. So, next. Biblical women trust deeply in God. They trust deeply in God and they rest in his sovereignty and goodness. Important for you to understand is God's sovereignty. There's a lot of things that could be bad that happen in life, right? But if something bad happens in your life, can you still trust God? Absolutely. Because God promises that he will work all things together for your good. So no matter what happens in your life, God is working good. You can trust him. You cannot trust that your life will always be easy. You cannot trust that everything is going to go great. God doesn't promise that. But he does promise that no matter what happens, he's going to cause it to work together for your good. And you can trust in that. You can take that to the bank and you know it is true. So let's look up some verses. 1 Peter 3 says, Do not let your adorning be external the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or cl the clothing that you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. And so God sees a gentle and quiet spirit. And he sees that's precious. What is a gentle and quiet spirit? Does that mean if you're a girl that you can't talk a lot? No. It's about your inside. It's about your spirit. And if you think about a calm lake that's gentle and quiet, it's just nothing, nothing ruffling the water. It's just perfectly still. That's a picture of the soul that is not concerned about anything, but is fully trusting in the Lord. But if you see, if you think of this water, just waves everywhere, the waves are getting so big, they're crashing, they're foaming white, and everything is shaking inside. Why is that? because I'm not trusting God, because I'm afraid, because I got to be in control, because you name it, right? The, there's no gentle, quiet spirit. There's just this 
turmoil within because you're not trusting in the Lord. And so, if you have turmoil in your heart tonight, if you've been experiencing turmoil in your life, if you feel like your spirit is not gentle and quiet, but there's a storm raging inside, ask yourself, have I been trusting God with what's going on in my life? Do I really believe that he's going to cause all things to work together for my good? And if you haven't been, stop doing that and believe the truth of God's word. It's true. He will cause all things to work together for your good so you can trust him. I'm going to look at another verse on this topic. Psalm 131. It says, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. Now this is David, King David writing this. And so this isn't just for women, but it's very applicable. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. Have you ever, have you ever held a baby who it just, just nursed and they're just happy and they're content and they're like, their eyes are just kind of closing and they're falling asleep and they're just peaceful, right? That's the picture here. Like a weaned child is my soul within me, just resting and trusting fully in God. And it says, oh, Israel, and we are Israel. Oh, people of God, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. So we can trust in the Lord, we can rest in him and not be afraid. We can trust in him deeply. John 12, before I say that, let me say the next point. Biblical women are not concerned about the opinions of others. Their aim is to please the Lord. I hear this often, that women are always looking and comparing themselves with other women, right? They're always thinking about what she's wearing, or what she's doing, or who she's hanging out with. There's this FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Oh, why did they do that? Why didn't I get invited? There's this constant concern and worry about what other people are doing, what other people are thinking. A biblical woman is not concerned about any of that. She's trusting in the Lord. John 12 says, Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in Jesus. But here's people who did not trust the Lord. It says, But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. An unbiblical woman loves the glory that comes from man. They are seeking everybody to praise them. They want everyone to like them. They're really worried about what everyone's thinking about them. But the biblical woman seeks the glory that comes from God and isn't so concerned about what other people think. Now, that doesn't mean, I don't care what people think, I'm going to be a big jerk. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you're not concerned about what people think about you. Matthew 6, 1 says, beware, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And so here's a warning not to be a people pleaser, not to fear what people think, and not to do things to be praised by people, but do everything to please your Father in heaven. Biblical women, next point, are beautiful on the inside and they know when and how to show it on the outside. 1 Peter 3 says, Do not let your adorning be external. It's an inner beauty. The braiding of hair and the putting on of gold, jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. And so, that doesn't mean you can't braid your hair. Doesn't mean you can't wear clothes, because actually a literal translation says don't put on clothing. Um, it's not about, you gotta wear clothes, okay? And it's okay if you wear some gold jewelry, but if that is your adorning, if that's what you are trying to make everyone think of who you are is your outward appearance only, and that's the only thing you're concerned about, you're missing the main thing. You're missing the most important part of yourself because guess what beauty is vain charm is deceitful right it's fleeting you may be young and beautiful right now but it won't be long before you'll have wrinkles and sunspots and 
it'll be getting flabby in various places and you can start getting bent over and you're not going to be beautiful your whole lives, right? If you ever go to an old folks home, you know what I mean, right? So what's important? What's inside? <laughs> what's inside? Now, I'm not saying that old folks are ugly, right? But they're not young and beautiful. So they, they are old, but many of them are beautiful on the inside still, right? Uh, there's a, there was a woman from Sarah's church growing up. What was her name? The, 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 you'd always talk about how beautiful she was. Grandma D. Grandma D. And she was this old lady and she just was like, like this and she just big face, just wrinkles upon wrinkles. But she was the most beautiful woman because she loved God so much and she was so loving and her smile was contagious. So beauty is first on the inside. All right. Let me do a few more verses. Proverbs 31, 30, we read that one. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Proverbs eleven twenty two is quite a sharp statement, but it's powerful and it's true. Like a gold, a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. So the gold ring is the beautiful woman. The pig is her heart. She's a pig because she doesn't have discretion. She's not beautiful on the inside. And so if you don't have discretion, which means you are self-controlled, you, you think through your decisions. You're, this woman without discretion is probably a promiscuous woman and someone who just does what she wants, when she wants, how she wants. And if you get in my way, you better watch out, right? This is the woman without discretion. It's like a pig's a pig with a gold gold ring in its nose. The, the gold ring doesn't do a lot for the pig, does it? It's still a pig. So inner beauty is number one. First Samuel 16, 7, I'm sure you guys have heard this one. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. The Lord looks on the heart. And who are we living to please? Other people? No. Living to please God. <clears throat> First Timothy 2.9 says, Women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So what is your clothing? It's good works. It's trust in the Lord. It's respectable apparel. It's, it's inward beauty first that leads to outward beauty. Now, a po an important point that I want to make. Biblical women focus on inward beauty, but that doesn't mean that you have to make yourself ugly, right? Some people read that it's like, Okay, I just need inner beauty, so I'm just going to wear sweatpants all the time, and I'm going to wear frumpy clothes. I'm not going to ever do my hair. I'm never going to put makeup on because I'm only worried about inward beauty. It's like, no, no, that's, that's not what this verse is saying. Now, you shouldn't be obsessed with beauty. You shouldn't be obsessing about how you look all the time, <clears throat> but you should make yourself presentable. And in marriage, your beauty is a blessing to your husband. And if you read Song of Solomon, I'm going to read some of it. He talks all about her beauty. So your outward beauty is a blessing, but it's vain. It's going away. It's not lasting. But a biblical woman knows to be modest in public, but beautiful for her husband, right? So you girls aren't married yet, so you don't need to worry about this yet. But when you're married, it's okay to be beautiful for your husband. Look at this. This is amazing. This is from the Bible, so I should not get in trouble for reading this in front of you guys, but it's a little bit sassy. So it says, <laughs> says, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind your veils. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Very sassy, that one right there. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins. She has all her teeth, which is very nice. 
and not one among them has lost its young. Your lips are like a scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David built in rows of stone, and on it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. She's wearing a very nice necklace, right? Your lips, oh, your two breasts are like the two fawns, twins of a gazelle that graze among the lilies until the day breathes and the shadows flee. I will go away to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Now, you might be like, ooh, this is, this is ah, awkward, right? This is, this is a blessing of marriage. This is a good thing. And beauty is a blessing. And I believe God has made women the fairer sex. He has made women beautiful. They're the glory of man, the Bible says. And they reflect the beauty of God. And so every woman is beautiful in her own way. And it's all right to have this outward beauty. But that is a gift to be shared between you and your husband mainly. But out and about, your goal shouldn't be to show yourself off. Out and about, your goal should be, I want people to see me and think, that person loves Jesus. That person reminds me of what Jesus was probably like. When they see you, they won't you should want them to see Jesus. And your, your beauty, keep it veiled for your husband and save that for him. So, a biblical woman focuses on inner beauty, which emanates through her whole being, and she knows when to show that beauty and when not to. All right, I want to I wanna share this story. And actually, it's kind of sad, but it's very beautiful. It's called The Heartbreaking Story of a Mother who became the world's ugliest woman to support her family. So this is interesting. <clears throat> and actually I looked up, uh, there was actually uglier women on, on Google. But she was considered and she was advertised as, and she won the contest as the world's ugliest woman. Why would she do this? Let me, let me read the story. In the 1900s, England, a mother of four took up the title of being the ugliest woman in the world. Why? To feed her children. Yes, here's her story. Who gives us the right to take someone as the prettiest or the ugliest? No one, but we do it anyway. Most recently, we picked the green-eyed Chihuahua from Pakistan as the hottest. Then we found a red-lipped Nepali young girl labeled her Tarkawali. The last and last our hearts to her. Google most handsome doctor and you'll find the fair skinned Dr. Mikhail Vesrash. Well, I don't know. Pictures crap up. Okay, let's keep going. But don't stop there. We sometimes in our minds and sometimes openly choose who we think is the ugliest of all. In the 1900s, England, mother of four, took the title Ugliest Woman in the World to Feed Her Children. Born in Newham, London in 1874, Mary Ann Bevan had an ordinary life as a young girl. She grew up to be a nurse and married a man named Thomas Bevan, with whom she had four children. Some years into their marriage, her health began showing signs of deterioration. What seemed like ugliness to most was actually a condition she was suffering from, known as acromegaly, acromegaly, in which the body produced growth hormones in excess. Mary Ann, with her children, while, the disproportion, while disproportionate bodily features were noticeable, what people couldn't see was the pain she suffered because of this disorder, which came in forms of splitting migraines and muscle aches. But physical ailments had to take a back seat as, after 11 years of marriage, her husband died, leaving her the sole breadwinner of their family. As their financial condition worsened, Mary chose to make a sacrifice. Sometime around the 1920s, Mary Ann entered a homeliest woman contest, also doubled, doubled as the ugly woman contest, in the hope of winning the prize, which could help her family. With the sacrifice of her dignity, she did win. But humiliation did not stop there for Marianne. After winning the contest, she got hired as a freak show performer in Coney Island's Dreamland Sideshow, which was a place where you had all kinds of freaks, people who were different, and people would go to pay and see them. This was a, an attraction in the 1900s. She also worked as, worked as a circus attraction 
Till her death in 1933, Mary Ann kept working at the Coney Island Dreamland Sideshow. And why was she doing that? To care for her children, to earn money. And so, though this woman was the winner of the ugliest woman in the world, she's actually quite beautiful, wasn't she? She did this for her children. And so, inner beauty is way more important than your outer beauty. And this is what she's remembered for. Not for her appearance per se, but for her, her inner beauty. And that's what's important. So I want to I wanna emphasize that with you, young ladies. So let's keep going. Bible's picture of a woman. Biblical women are good listeners and good communicators, not nagging or manipulative. <clears throat> they have control of their tongues. Now this is important because it's often mentioned in Proverbs. But know this, my beloved brothers and sisters, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Proverbs 19.13, this is not a verse you want your husband to show you in the Bible one day. So being your youth pastor, I'm going to show it to you now so that you learn the lesson of it and do not become this woman. A wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. There's more. Proverbs 21, 19. It is better to live in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. The wisest of women builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. And that's by quarrelsome. It's quarrelsomeness. And other versions actually use the word nagging. So it's better to live on the corner of a housetop than with a nagging, quarrelsome wife. And nagging is this idea of always picking at, always criticizing, always, never being happy, always saying what he needs to change, what he needs to do differently, is never good enough, and it's always picking a fight and out, never being happy. And why is there some women like that? They're not trusting in the Lord with their husband. God gave you that husband. You can trust him. So, a godly woman is not quarrelsome. She does not nag. She is not manipulative. Titus 2, 3 says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. And this is the communication, not gossiping about people. They are to teach what is good and to train this, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. So there's a lot that it has to do with communication. Now, that doesn't mean you can't talk about problems and you can't bring things up that need to be fixed, but there's a way to bring it up that isn't critical, that isn't harsh, that isn't manipulative, and that isn't quarrelsome, right? And so by God's grace, you can be loving and kind and be a life giver with your words and give grace to those who hear rather than tearing people down. Biblical women are honest, trustworthy, and faithful, an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and she will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Proverbs 31, I got part of the verse in the, the point, but her husband trusts in her. A biblical woman is a trustworthy woman. A biblical woman is an honest woman. A biblical woman is a faithful woman. And her husband trusts in her fully. How do you be trustworthy? You do what you say you're going to do. And you, you keep to your word. And you, and you fulfill your promises. That's how you do it. Biblical women are kind, patient, gentle, and forgiving. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And so we, just like men, are to be kind and tender and gentle, so are women. All of us, all the time, should always be kind and gentle with one another, patient and forgiving. Biblical women are not ruled by their emotions. Now, it doesn't mean you can't ever cry. I'm not saying that, okay? It's all right to cry. But you're not ruled by your emotions. 
1 Peter 3 says, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good, and do not fear anything that is frightening. See, Sarah did not follow her emotions. She was frightened by what Abraham asked her to do. But she did not fear, and she obeyed her husband, even calling him Lord, and she didn't follow her feelings. She wasn't ruled by her emotions. She did what God called her to do, and she did not fear what was frightening. So, doesn't mean you can't have emotions. We all have emotions, and emotions are a gift from God, actually. They're a good thing. But you can't be ruled by your emotions. Your emotions don't dictate what you do. God's word dictates what we do. And finally, biblical women are constantly seeking knowledge and learning. Now, this is something that is very important because sometimes people who have a biblical view of men and women think that women should, you know, they don't need to be educated. They should just work in the home barefoot in the kitchen, right? Now, it's not wrong to be barefoot in the kitchen. That's right. But you can be smart. You can be wise. You can go to school. You can learn. And you should be a studier, mostly, of God's word. Every person, man and woman, should be a student their whole life. Should always be learning God's word. Proverbs 2 says, My son, and I'm going to say, My daughter, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. <clears throat> Every one of us should be a student of God's word, constantly learning, constantly seeking to grow and not saying, I don't, you know, I'm just this, I'm just that. I don't need education. Yes, we all need to learn. We all need to be seeking knowledge, especially knowledge of God's word. Now, things that are not necessary to biblical womanhood, right? Now, this is important. We went over this with the guys, but natural looks. You don't have to be beautiful to be a godly woman. You don't have to be beautiful on the outside to be beautiful inside, right? We saw that the world's ugliest woman was very beautiful on the inside. The strength of a man, right? Anything you can do, I can do better. You don't need to be strong. You don't have to go around competing with everybody trying to be strong to somehow prove yourself. That's not how you prove yourself as a woman. You prove yourself when you live out the principles of what it means to be a godly woman, not when you're as strong as a man. Now, you might be stronger than some men, and that's okay. But you don't have to have children or a husband to be a godly woman. Did you know that? Now, if you have a husband one day, that's a blessing. If he gives you children, that's a blessing. But neither of those things are guaranteed, and neither of those things are necessary or required for you to be a godly woman. They're a, they're a blessing from God. But if he doesn't give you those things, you can please him and live a fulfilled and beautiful life either way. A job outside the home. You don't have to have a job. Even though the Proverbs 31 woman, she did a lot of work. She bought fields and sold fields. And in our culture today, people think, well, if you don't get a job, then you're somehow failing. That's the feminist idea in our culture today. You do not have to have a job outside of the home to be a biblical woman. But here's the thing. You don't have to only work in the home to be a biblical woman. If you choose and you, let's say you're married and you and your husband choose that you work because you want to, that's okay too, right? There's freedom in Christ for you to choose. Now, I wouldn't marry a guy though, girls, who is like, you know, I'll pay my fair share, and but you got to do your half too. So you have to work. Don't marry a guy like that, okay? Because he's, if you are going to be raising the kids, taking care of the home full time, and having a job full time, and he just has a full time job, 
who's doing more work? You are. And he's thinking that's fair. He doesn't get it. So marry a man who is willing to support you. But if you choose to work outside the home, that doesn't make you not a biblical woman. No, it's important to take care of your children as well. I just want to just make a point. When you have kids, if the Lord blesses you with kids, they're little for a little time. They're small for a very short window of your life. And they, and you have, let's say you lived 80 years and your kids are little for 10 years. You can work for 70 years, but you can take 10 years or 20 years of that time to raise your kids and then still do a career. So don't be afraid to take care of your kids when, when you have them. You're not required to work outside the home, but you're not also required to work in the home only. Finally, natural intelligence. Now I did say you gotta be a learner, but you don't have to be the brightest bulb in the bunch, right? You can figure, all of you can figure out these things. You don't have to be the most smart person in the world to be a godly woman. So I hope that gives you guys a little direction and also gives you a little hope. Here's the thing. Nobody is able to fulfill this perfectly, but it's by God's grace that we can live out these things. Last week, what it means to be a biblical man. This week, what it means to be a biblical woman. We all fail, but Christ was perfect for us and he is our savior. So let's pray and we'll go in our small groups. Dear Father, thank you for this time that we could study your word and just look through these, all these truths about what it means to be a godly, biblical woman. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand these things. And I pray for the girls that they will live it out and the guys that they will seek this in their future spouse one day. We pray in Jesus' name.